Well, hello again. Welcome to our journey into complex analysis. We're in section 11 now, which is on zeros and poles. So we've seen in the previous sections that we can use these remarkable Laurent series uh, in order to evaluate integrals. But the point is that we're really only interested in extracting the residue out of the Laurent series. So it would be nice to be able to extract the residues without having to do all the calculations on these, calculating these Laurent series, especially if we've got a number of different singularities. So to do that, we're going to introduce this notion of zeros and poles, and then from that we'll see a nice way of getting extracting the residues. So firstly, the idea of a zero. So uh, zero of a function, of course, are the points which make the function zero. But we're going to try and classify them a little bit more tightly. So if we take a function which is analytic at z naught, so it has a Taylor series, which we can write like this. And that's going to be valid inside some disk center z naught radius r. Now we know then that n factorial times this coefficient is the nth derivative, because that's how we calculate the coefficients the nth derivative of f at z naught. So z naught then is a zero of f. So if it's a zero of f, then a naught is zero, so that we can factor a z out of it at least once. In the case when the first derivative, when the function is zero at z naught, so it's just, it's a zero of some sort, and the second derivative is zero, and all the way up to the m minus one, m minus one derivative at z naught is zero, but the nth derivative, I should say here at z naught, is not zero. Then we say that z naught is a zero um, of f of order m. In other words, we can write this function f of z as z minus z naught to the m times g of z, and that should be g of z naught is not zero. That is, we can pull out of this function the factor z minus z naught m times, and then we're left with a function which is not zero at z naught. So, for example, if we take a look at this function here, which is already a nice factorized form, we can see that minus 4 is a 0 of order 1, whereas i, sometimes called a simple 0, whereas z equals i is a 0 of order 5. Now, here it was obvious because this was just, this was just in polynomial factored form, uh, but if we've got functions in here like this, um, certainly if I put z is 0 in, cos of naught's 1 minus 1 is 0, so it's a 0 of some sort, and we'd like to know what the order of the 0 is. So here is the work solution for that. So we've got f of z is cos z minus 1 to the 6th, and we're looking at this 0 at z is 0. And the way to see what's going on with this is, of course, to go back and turn everything into series. So I'm going to replace cos z with its series, 1 minus z squared on 2 factorial, z to the 4th and 4 factorial, dot, dot, dot. And then we've got a minus 1. Now the 1's cancel, and I can take out, I can factor a z squared out of what's left. And then I can take that completely out and write that as z to the 12th. And I'm left, what I'm left with in the brackets here then is minus 1 on 2 factorial plus other terms. The point being that this function in here is not 0 at 0. In fact, when z is 0, this factor in here is just minus a half. So I can write this as z to the 12 times some function I'm going to call capital phi of z, with the property that capital phi of naught is not naught. And that means out of this function we can take a z to the power 12. And so we say that f has a 0 of order 12 when z is 0. So the key to this thing is to look at when you've got these uh, transcendental functions is to turn them into series. Now, we want to turn our zeros in some sense upside down and we're going to turn them into poles. And in order to extract the residue from a given function with a singularity at z naught, 
we're going to classify the different types of isolated singularities that can occur. So in what follows, we're going to suppose that F has an isolated singularity at Z0. If the principal part of the Laurent series for F of Z about Z0 is naught, then we say that Z0 is a removable singularity. If the principal part, if it's got no principal part, if it's just zero, then we call that a removable singularity. A classic example is sine z on z. This clearly has a singularity at z is zero because you've got undefined naught over naught. If you write down the, the the series of this, then it's going to begin with one, and there's no uh, principal part. Moreover, we can also see this by simply taking a limit as z goes to naught of this, and of course this limit is 1. So this has a removable singularity at z naught uh, equals naught. In fact, we could define f of 0 to be 1 and that would make for this function, and that would then make this function analytic everywhere. Now we can test for a removable singularity simply by looking at the limit as z goes to z naught of f of z. If that exists, then the function has a removable singularity at z naught. And the residue, of course, in such a case is zero, because there's no principal part. On the other hand, uh, suppose now that the Laurent series of, our, um, z, uh, of f about z naught has this form. So this is the Taylor part up here, and then we go back one term, there's the residue here, but it goes all the way back to B sub M, where of Z minus Z naught to the M, where this thing is not zero. We've seen before some uh, Taylor, some Laurent series go back forever, other ones are um, going to go back a finite number of terms, and we're going to assume it goes back this far. And that means then I can take out z minus z naught to the minus m. I can factor that out. And then the first term I'll get in the brackets will be b sub m, which is not 0. So I'll get some other new function here I'm going to call 5z. And the point is that phi of z naught uh, is not 0. So phi of z naught exists and is not 0. I may have put on the next uh, page. So phi of z naught exists, and so phi is analytic and not zero at z naught. There it is there, and b sub m is not zero. So this is like the reciprocal of a zero of order m now becomes a pole of order m. So in this case, we say that z naught is a pole of order m. Now, in the case when m is 1, that is, there's only one term in the um, principal part with the, um, well, more than, the, what I should say, if m equals 1, if the principal part just looks like b1 over z minus z naught, then we're going to call this a simple pole. Now, we love simple poles. They're very nice, as we'll see. So how do we test for one of those? Well, we just, in general, to test for a pole of order m, we're going to multiply the function by z minus z naught to the m and take a limit as z goes to z naught. If that, but if that limit exists and is not zero, then we have a pole of order m. And again, we can see that just quickly looking back to the series. If we take our Laurent series down here and I multiply everything through by z minus z naught to the m, then I'm going to end up with uh, and then take a limit as z goes to z naught, I'll get phi of z naught, and phi of z naught is not zero. And, and the limit exists, the function's analytic, so the limit exists. Now, um, so that's going to be our test for a pole of order m. We multiply by z minus z naught to the m f of z. Now we need to do a little bit more work, in fact a lot more work, to find the, the residue of a general pole of order m. 
Now I'll leave you to check the, to go through the calculations here, but if we take that Laurent series I had on the previous page, if we multiply by Z minus Z naught to the M, this will produce um, this term somewhere in the series. That term with the B sub minus M will now have this in front of it, to the M minus 1. And we're trying to get our hands on the B1. So B sub minus 1. Now if we take the m minus 1th derivative, all the terms to the left of this one in the series will all differentiate out to 0. All the terms on the right of this one will have a z minus z naught up the top, and when you put z equals z naught, they will all disappear. And this term will turn into uh, m minus 1 factorial b sub minus 1, when we take a limit as z goes to z naught. So taking the limit as z goes to z naught and dividing by m minus 1 factorial will get, enable us to get our hands on the residue. So that will just leave the b sub minus 1 the residue. So here's our formula. If we've got z naught is a pole of order m, then the residue of f, what do we do? We take the function we multiply by z minus z naught to the m. We have to take the m minus 1th derivative of all this. And then we divide by, one, uh, divide by m minus 1 factorial and take a limit as z goes to z naught. And that will pull out the residue, the b sub minus 1. Now, in practice, this can be very tedious because this may be quite complicated and having to differentiate it many times may be very difficult and te uh, tedious to do. Sometimes we'll just go back and use series. Uh, and in the case when this is easy to differentiate, we'll just differentiate. In the case, however, of a simple pole, then that's when m is 1. And that's simply going to mean that all of this disappears. Uh, and the formula then will be just reduces to this. So the formula then just reduces to, you might take the function, multiply by z minus z naught, and take a limit as z goes to z naught. So if that limit exists, and by the way, that's the check for uh, seeing whether it is a simple pole anyway. So the, uh, so the limit we find in checking it has a simple pole also gives us the residue. So this is very nice. Simple poles are lovely because you can check their simple poles and you get the residue for free just by calculating this simple limit. You multiply by z minus z naught times f of z. And if that exists, it's a simple pole. And that limit, the value of that limit, is in fact the residue. For higher order poles, as I said, this formula can be difficult to apply and we may have to revert, revert, revert back to series again. So just note here that if g of z has a zero of order m at z naught, then 1 over g of z, of course, has a pole of order m at z naught. Now, in the case, this was all in the case when the principal part of the Laurent series was a finite series. If that's not the case, if it's an infinite series, if it goes back forever, then we say that z naught is an essential singularity. Multiplying by z minus z naught over and over again is not going to get rid of it. And a typical example of this is the function e to the 1 on z. If you expand this out in series, you get 1 plus 1 on z plus 1 on 2 factorial z squared plus 1 on 3 factorial z cubed with all these z's in the denominator. And so this one has an infinite principal part and it therefore has an essential singularity at z is naught and the residue you can read off is 1. In evaluating limits, we're going to make extensive use of L'Hopital's rule, which we assume without proof holds for complex limits. In fact, L'Hopital's rule is just wonderful here and really is very, very useful uh, in calculating these, these limits. And we'll see later on when we get to applying this, uh, these ideas to various problems. L'Hopital is just fantastic. 
Okay, so here we're going to classify the singularities of each of the following and uh, get the residue at each singularity. So just going to work through these examples here. So the first one, uh, best to see all this by example, here's the first one here. Uh, f of z is e to the 2z on z minus 3. Now it's pretty obvious that this is a very simple example. This obviously has a singularity at z equals 3. That's my z naught. And moreover, if I multiply this function by z minus 3, then that cancels out. You just get e to the 2z. You put z as 3 and you get e to the 6, which is not 0. And that tells me immediately that z equals 3 is a simple pole and you get the residue for free. The, the limit we get here is the residue. So that's a very simple example. The second one, we're going to look at cos z minus 1 over z cubed. And I'll do this in a couple of ways. Firstly, uh, there's a singularity at z equals to 0. And we might hope perhaps it's a simple pole, so let's just experiment. If I take this function and I'm going to multiply it by z to the 1 and see what happens as I take a limit as z goes to 0. So I multiply by z to the 1, I get cos z minus 1 on z squared. Now this is a 0 over 0 type limit, so I can use L'Hopital's rule. I'm going to differentiate the top, I get minus sign z, differentiate the bottom, I get 2z. And we know that sine z over z goes to 1, so this limit is a half. Aha! That means this limit, so multiplying the function by z to the 1, and then taking a limit, the limit exists and is minus a half. So that immediately tells me that was a good guess, that it was a simple pole. So z equals naught is a simple pole, and the residue pops out for free. An alternate way of doing this is just to use series here, because it's, um, it's very simple. Could also do this by series. If I replace cos z with its series, subtract 1 divided by z cubed. So they cancel out and do it simplify. We get the first term is minus 1 on 2 factorial z, and I'm going to get plus the rest of the series. There's the principal part. It goes back z to the 1, so it's a simple pole, and there's the residue multiplying it. Now, for part C, we were asked for sine z over z to the 30. Well, I clearly, I'm going to use series here, I think, for this one. So, again, I'm going to replace sine z with its series. And um, uh, when you take the brackets in, you're going to get 1 on z to the 29, all the way down to um, this term here. We'll give you 1 on z times 29 factorial in the denominator, plus you get the rest of the terms. So here's the principal part. We This goes all the way to 29. So that tells me z equals 0 is a pole of order 29. And the residue we can just read off is 1 over 29 factorial. Now we could also do this the other way, we could uh, multiply this thing by z to the 29, uh, that would be very difficult, you see, to use the formula. If you multiply this by z to the 29, you'll get sine z on z, you have to then differentiate that, using the quotient rule, heaven spares, 28 times, and then you'd have to then put z equals to take a limit as z goes to 0, which I can see is going to turn out to be 1, I think, and then you have to divide by 29 factorial, and that's where this would come in. So this one is much better done using series rather than the formula. The formula is very useful if you've got simple poles or perhaps pole of order 1. Okay, example D, this is a little bit more sophisticated. This is 1 over z minus sine z. And again, we turn everything into series to try and see what's going on here. So I turn z minus sine z into series. So I get z minus, there's the series for sine z. The z's cancel. I end up with a z cubed as a common factor of what's left. So I take it out. And then I get 1 over 3 factorial minus and so on. 
So that tells me this function in the denominator has a zero of order three. And so when you put one over it, the f is going to have a pole of order three at z is zero. Now, we want to get the residue. So we notice this f is an odd function. That's a very useful observation here because that means I can write down what the Laurent series of this must look like. We've seen it's a pole of order 3, so the principal part can only go back to terms with z cubed in them. And it's an e odd function, so it's only going to have odd, power, odd to powers of z, top and bottom. So there's no a sub minus 2 on z squared term. Well, a sub minus 2 is just 0. So that saves a bit of time to observe that, in fact. So that's the series must look like that, dot, dot, dot. And on the other hand, it's supposed to look like 1 over. That's what we got up here. When we, uh, when we simplified that, we get this expression. Now, we take a deep breath and cross-multiply. So I'm going to multiply this series by this series. And the answer's got to be 1. Now we, take, now, we take all the brackets out. We're going to expand. Now, if you look at it, look at the constant term firstly. The constant term is going to come from this one multiplied by this one. So you get a sub minus 3 on 3 factorial, and the constant term on this side is 1. So that tells you a sub minus 3 immediately is equal to 6, 3 factorial. The next highest power of z we're going to see is z squared, and that's going to come from this one times this one, and this one times this one. So I multiply those out, so I get that times that, uh, which will give me the coefficient of z squared will be a sub minus 1 of 3 factorial, and this times this, you get a sub minus 3 on 5 factorial. And that's it, they're the only z squared terms you'll see on the left hand side, and there is no z squared terms, there are no z squared terms over here, so this has got to be 0. Well, we know what this number is, so I can just plug this in, and I get a sub minus 1 is 3 tenths. And that's what I wanted. So there's the residue at this point, is 3 tenths. So you can see, sometimes we we'll might use the formula, but in many situations, we're going to simply use the series to work out the residue. Now, we'll get, have a look at one quick little application um, of this. And we're going to work out this um, this uh, in this integral now using our ideas of residues. So we want the integral around mod z equals two e to the z on sine z sine of z minus one. So here is the uh, work solution for this. So here's the um, here's the integral. I always draw a little circle to show my contour. And this one is going to have singularities. There's my function, the integrand. I'll call that f of z. This has singularities in the circle at z equals 0. Put a cross there. And z equals 1. Always draw the circle. Mark in the singularities to make sure they're inside the contour. If they're outside, well, it doesn't contribute anything to the value of the integral. Now, I claim that both of these are simple poles. So we're starting off with z equals naught. And I'm going to try multiplying by z once to see what happens. So I multiply by z once. I get z on sine z. And then I copy the rest of the function down. And we're going to take a limit as z goes to naught. Well, that one, of course, that's a well-known limit. You can use L'Hopital, but that one just goes to 1. e to the naught is 1 and I get sine minus 1, so that's minus cosec 1. Again, that tells me that z equals naught is a simple pole, and you get the residue for free. Similarly, at z equals 1, I'm going to try multiplying the function by z minus 1 and take a limit. So there's the function, multiplied by z minus 1, take a limit. Once again, I've got z minus 1 over sine of z minus 1, this limit clearly goes to 1. So you put that in, you get e over sine 1, which is e cosec 1. So again, z equals 1 is a simple pole with residue e cosec 1. 
and we know from the residue theorem that the integral then is 2 pi i times the sum of the residues. So we get e cosec 1 minus 1 times cosec 1. Now there's a little challenge problem you might like to have a look at. Um, if, we, uh, if we have f as a pole of order m at z naught, then the logarithmic derivative, this f dashed over f, turns out to have a simple pole at z naught, and we're asked to find the residue. In fact, I thought, although I normally don't do these challenge problems, this is such a nice one, I thought I would indulge myself and do this one for you. So here we have f of z then has a pole of order m at z naught. That means this function looks like 1 over z naught to the m times some capital phi, where phi of z naught is not naught and phi is analytic of z naught. That's what we mean by a pole of order m. Now this is the logarithmic derivative, so I'm going to take logs of both sides, so I get log of phi minus m log z minus z naught. And then I simply take the derivative of both sides, so I put function on the bottom, derivative on the top. Function on the bottom, derivative on the top. This phi is analytic, so I can differentiate it. And this one just becomes minus m on z minus z naught. Now, phi dashed is, phi is an analytic function, so phi dashed is analytic, phi of z is analytic. So this expression here is analytic at z naught, so it has a Taylor series about z naught. So if I were to expand this thing out as a series, it's just a normal Taylor series. So the principal part then will be this expression here, and that tells me then that this uh, logarithmic derivative has a principal part of that, which tells me that this is a simple pole at z naught, and there's the residue here, it's just minus m. And that's the end of that section.